To begin, I'd like to recognize the people of the three fires, the Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi peoples on whose land we are gathered today. The three fires people are indigenous to this land, which means that this is their ancestral territory. Every university in this country was built on indigenous land. We conduct land acknowledgments as a reminder of the impact of settler colonialism and as a reminder of the histories, teachings, traditions, and first peoples who originated here and who tend to land and earth always. Welcome. It's inspiring to be part of this Climate Change Education Solutions Summit and to witness so many change makers in action. This summit began in 2018 with support from the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences and the Regional Math and Science Center, and it's exciting to see how this event has expanded its impact over the years, due in no small part to Elena's vision and hard work. And if we could just give her a round of applause, please. You're amazing. We wouldn't be here without you. Uh, this summit is just one of the many ways that the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences here at Grand Valley is responding to climate change. The Annis Water Resources Institute and the Departments of Biology, Chemistry, Geology, and Geography and Sustainable Planning came together last year to hire a group of four faculty members with expertise in aquatic restoration and sustainability. These faculty members are building relationships with each other and other Grand Valley teacher scholars to develop shared research agendas that will advance solutions to scientific and social justice challenges. This multidisciplinary collaboration also creates increased capacity for community partnerships, innovative curriculum design, and the expansion of high impact learning experiences for students. Experiential learning is already a strength of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences and across Grand Valley. For example, students have opportunities to participate in research and education initiatives at the Annis Water Resources Institute. Located in Muskegon, AWRI is committed to enhancing and preserving water quality in the Great Lakes region. It's a leading research center on issues that affect environmental policy and legislation and offers an education and outreach program that has brought more than 100,000 passengers aboard its biodiesel-fueled research vessels, including many K-12 students. Another experiential learning opportunity for students is our Water in the West program. This four-week trip across the southwestern U.S. was offered for the first time this spring by two faculty members, one from Brooks College of Interdisciplinary Studies, one from the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, who engage students in learning about water resource management issues through the lenses of geology and sustainability. These are just a few of the ways that the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences is leading in education around climate change and sustainability. Uh, anyone who's interested in learning more, feel free to reach out to my office. We're, we're happy to share. Uh, and now I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Fatma Milli, the Provost and Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs here at Grand Valley State University. Dr. Milley joined Grand Valley in July 22. Prior to coming to Grand Valley, she served as the Dean of the College of Computing and Informatics at UNC Charlotte, where she led the college through a five-year period of growth in enrollment, retention, and research. Her distinctive impact at UNC Charlotte centered around instilling a culture of equity and embracing responsibility for the social and ethical impacts of technology. Before her deanship at UNC Charlotte, she was at Purdue University where she led one of Purdue's Big Moves projects that transformed the College of Technology into Purdue Polytechnic. Dr. Milley has deep Michigan roots. She began her academic career as a professor at Oakland University in the School of Computer Science and Engineering. Her research was in the areas of formal methods, intelligent systems, and nature-inspired adaptive systems, and was funded by federal agencies as well as industrial partners. Throughout her career, Dr. Milley has been embracing the transformational role that higher education has in society. If you could help me welcome her. Welcome everyone. Welcome to the GVSU fifth annual Climate Change Education Solutions Summit. First, I would like to thank you for being here and for investing your expertise, your passion, 
and your agency to the biggest challenge of our times. If there is any issue to which we should be devoting attention, it is this one. It is important, it is urgent, it affects the future of every one of our current and future students and their families. If there is any issue for which we must take leadership and ownership, it is this one. We have the intellectual capacity, the combined expertise, and the collaborative structures. We have the temperament to think long-term, to take ambitious risks, fail sometimes, but persist with passion and determination. We have, as our vocation, human development and future creation. Our focus is on the present, but much more so, it is on the future and on the long term. We have the intellectual academic freedom to pursue issues and take them wherever the data and the science lead us. And we have the most important motivation and motivator, the students in our classrooms, the future generations whose very future is at risk. Our students are the leaders and the reminders of how existential this question is. In addition to these reasons that may apply to every university, GVSU is uniquely positioned to be a leader in this topic. GVSU's successive presidents have, in each in their own way, shown foresight and commitment to the protection of the environment. Our first president, Dr. James Zumberg, was a geologist who led several expeditions to Antarctica. He contributed to the understanding of climate change. Our former president, Dr. Tom Haas, is a chemist who was solicited for his expertise to shape the cleanup of the Exxon Valdez oil spill, the second big, biggest spill in human history. President Mantalla is one of the early signature, signatories of the president's climate leadership commitments, pledging to explore bold and innovative solutions and to lead in climate action and sustainable solutions. GVSU is also surrounded and supported by a community that is deeply committed to the creation of an equitable and sustainable society. The PADNAS have been national leaders in their work to reducing waste and modeling the use of renewable energy in their business and in their partnerships with GVSU. The Huntics have been very deliberate in making Steelcase an environmentally conscious business and in supporting high-risk, high-return research at GVSU, mostly around the protection and restoration of the, areas of, of the area's water resources. And I can keep listing over many of our donors and our friends of the university who have really shown um, deep insight and commitment for the environment. And la last but not least, GVSU faculty and staff who are the core of this university, who across divisions, across colleges, across disciplines, continue to cultivate these values in their work and in their interactions and, um, and in their commitments. GVSU continues to be assessed as a gold performer by the Association of the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education. Year after year, GVSU receives the highest possible number of points in both research and education. And GVSU has a multitude of academic programs, research centers, and faculty research agendas around sustainability. And this in almost every single discipline and in every, uh, in every single college. And um, the disciplines range from biology, geology, geography, um, engineering, health, literature, visual arts, history, chemistry, and I keep going every single discipline. We have some, at least some faculty who are really devoting some of their research and their teaching to this topic. So we are here thanks to the hard work of our leaders, our supporters, and our faculty and students. We are here because we are student-centered and future-centered. This conference, the annual Climate Change Education Solutions Summit, 
is one of the best examples of what we do here at GVSU. So I would like to thank the organizers and welcome all of you. I hope that through this event, you will learn, you will create new connections, and that you will, have, you will leave further inspired and energized. Thank you and welcome. Many thanks, uh, Dean Drake and Provost Milley. I am now absolutely honored to introduce our speaker, Dedry Nieves. Dedry is a faculty member at Western Michigan University and Director of Climate Solutions and Justice at Western Michigan Environmental Action Council. Her scholarly research focuses on climate change refugees and displacement, climate adaptation, and marginalized populations. As a faculty at Western Michigan University, Professor Nieves teaches courses on climate change, African American studies, and impacts on marginalized populations. Deidre holds a bachelor's degree in environmental studies, a master's degree in anthropology, and is now finishing her PhD in interdisciplinary studies at Western Michigan University. She was an environmental fellow at the University of Michigan School of Environment and Sustainability in 2021, and Michigan Space Grant Fellow during the academic year 21-22. Deidre is not a stranger to GVSU. We have been collaborating on Michigan Resources for Climate and Land Change Education Project funded by Michigan Space Grant Consortium in 2021-2022 and 2023. Uh, in um, all these years, has been ex Deidre has been exceptionally involved in a variety of different environmental initiatives in West Michigan. She is a founder of Schools for Climate Action Michigan, serves on the City of Portage Environmental Board, and is a member of the National Black Climate Action Network and Citizens Climate Lobby. Please help me to welcome Deidre Nevis, um, our first speaker. Okay, um, I think I just want to test to see if this works with the, oh, yep, it works. <laughs> okay, so um, thank you, Elena. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, again, I am Deirdre Courtney Nieves. Um, I'd like to thank um, first, um, the uh, Climate Change Education Solutions Network and GVSU. Um, for their fifth year um, tackling climate in the way that they are as it relates to uh, climate change education. Um, and thank you all for coming. Um, I'll try to skip past um, my introduction since Elena did a great job um, introducing me. I don't have too much more to say other than the fact that I am a PhD student, currently a professor um, at Western Michigan University. Um, I am an educator. I consider myself a social scientist. Um, that is a hint that I will not be um, talking in a technical terms today um, for um, any of you that may be concerned about that. Um, I am an environmental justice professional and I'm a climate change advocate. So um, I'll just kind of leave it at that in terms of um, additions to my um, my introduction, but I'll, I'll spend some time um, today just talking about my role with West Michigan Environmental Action Council and also um, my education, t teaching, um, uh, my teaching um, at Western Michigan University and in the community as it relates to climate change um, education. 
Okay, so just a bit about um, the WEMIAC organization, West Michigan Environmental Action Council. For those of you that aren't familiar, um, this uh, organization is located here in Grand Rapids, Michigan. The organization was formed um, in the late 60s, uh, 1968, by Joan Wolf, who was at the time really considered um, to be a trailblazer and um, ahead of her time as a woman spearheading a group of uh, local concerned citizens to tackle local environmental um, issues in the Grand River uh, area, Grand Rapids area, as it relates to um, issues of degradation around the Grand River. Um, at the time, Grand Rapids, like many other uh, cities across the nation, were being um, the result of decades long of environmental degradation due to increased manufacturing, um, industrialized, uh, industrialization and abuse that sort of plagued our natural, national, uh, natural resources. Um, it is a nonprofit uh, organization positioned to respond to emerging issues um, and new threats to West Michigan and um, our human ecologies uh, strategically focused on building sustainable communities and um, protecting water resources. And so in the last decade or so, um, WEMIAC has been um, intentional in their efforts uh, to hearing from the community um, and stepping up our efforts to engage with individuals and communities, especially members of the black and brown communities here in this area, Grand Rapids, Muskegon, and Kalamazoo, uh, to name a few. Although WEMIAC has always been working on issues that impact minority communities, we knew that uh, we could be doing so much more. In addition to all of our uh, wonderful staff and projects focused on uh, health and wellness of the environment um, and support for black and brown communities, we have um, our uh, director of sustainable community, which is Carlos Calderon, um, who represents a member of the black and brown communities, um, and two brand new positions, including mine, uh, director of climate solutions and justice, and a new director of engagement, uh, Marshall Kilgore, who you will all um, undoubtedly hear from tomorrow um, when he gives his presentation. Um, so we're, we're three individuals that represent and have a footprint in um, black and brown communities and are now um, engaged in these sort of efforts with West Michigan Environmental Action Council. Okay, and uh, part of our uh, purview or our work, uh, we are working to redirect our programs uh, to focus on climate resiliency, education, and the intersection of environmental justice, uh, continuing outreach and implementation of clean water um, infrastructure along with partnerships with uh, BIPOC communities, so uh, members of the black and brown and people of color communities, allowing their expertise in education and awareness, um, especially related to um, the impacts that they face here in Grand Rapids and around the region uh, related to climate and climate resiliency. Um, we're really um, we're doing more to engage these communities and hearing their voice and giving them space um, at the table. We are um, doing a lot to expand our outreach. In the past few months, we have worked with local, state, and federal legislators to demand their support for the passage and um, defense of historic climate change legislation. This um, has been a main role of mine specifically to connect with these leaders based on um, new partnerships, uh, with climate action, with the climate action campaign specifically, I have been um, advocating in the last few months in Lansing, um, in DC, and in the Detroit area um, as of late on these particular issues. These are some of the uh, these are some of the events that you see here. Um, I don't have time to kind of spend time on them all, but uh, just note that. Um, these are legislative um, events uh, centered around the in, um, Inflation Reduction Act and um, celebrating um, historic uh, climate change legislation. And a lot of the work that I um, do in the community as it relates to uh, legislation and policy, I do try to incorporate a lot of this work into 
um, education uh, and uh, with students that I teach. Um, so again, it's really a lot to sort of lay out here in terms of lesson plans for you all, but, um, but this is just a, a, a small way of showing um, ways that I share this knowledge in the classroom. And so um, with that, I'd like to just share two um, very brief examples of how I bring this sort of community engagement into the classroom. If I have a chance or opportunity, I'd like to show a video um, or two, some short snippets um, if, if I have time for that. Okay, so as a result of the work that I do in the community, I like to bring these lessons into the classrooms. Um, these are great lessons to help students take action in their own communities. I design courses around individuals um, that I meet and who um, inspire uh, me that um, can be uh, historic uh, figures and modern day thought leaders on the subject of environmental justice and climate change impacts. Um, and, and they're doing a lot of work um, regionally and nationally and by uh, uh, subjects of environmental justice and BIPOC communities. Many of these individuals that you see here um, have published, um, are published authors on the subject of climate change and environmental justice, and um, they're spending their time engaging in multiple communities, uh, learning and sharing what they have um, with others. Um, these are a few of the specific texts that I use in my classroom and um, design uh, text around. Um, and these are definitely lessons that students can learn from. So um, any of these are great examples um, for you to use in the classrooms when teaching um, your students. And as a result, students will be oriented with environmental justice concepts. Um, and issues, students will learn from specific thought leaders and will develop a list of environmental justice leaders um, in the field and expand their knowledge on who these individuals are and the various topics. Um, they will increase or expand their knowledge in specific environmental justice and climate justice um, education and concerns. Uh, they will also be able to identify environmental justice communities and where they are located um, here in this area and across the region and nation. Uh, they will also gain, uh, it, they'll gain um, knowledge on, on the interdisciplinary approach to learning about environmental justice issues and they'll learn about advocacy and how to take action in their own communities and abroad. And so, again, this is just one way that I bring environmental justice into the um, classroom by um, integrating um, lessons from individuals that I may know personally or that I've utilized um, or learned from on my own through text or um, in, in community organ through community organizations. Okay, and then another um, example um, I have for you here. Um, it's just really um, community engagement um, as a whole. So um, as a result of the knowledge that I gained from um, these leaders, again, um, in uh, the community engaging with um, environmental justice communities, um, I try to bring an experiential learning um, to the classroom. So, and I think that this is something that you all can um, do as well in your classrooms if you're not able to um, take students out into the community, you can certainly bring the community to them uh, through lessons um, and uh, experiential learning opportunities. So whether in their own backyards or more widely with organizations and groups in the community. Um, so just note that it's important to build um, community relationships. Um, one, you can start with individuals that you know. Um, and or areas that you may have interest in um, and you you can uh, invite your students to learn more about those um, areas of interest. And then specifically here, I just want to share some examples um, that I have here um, in April, which was spring semester, the beginning of summer semester um, 2023. I took a group of Lee Honors College students from Western Michigan University on a study in the states um, 
uh, expedition or experience in Syracuse, New York. Um, these students, a group of, I would say about eight students, um, joined me to learn about um, the historic 15th Ward. Um, so this was a community that was sort of um, displaced in the early uh, 1940s and 50s uh, due to the intrusion of, a, of the development of a, um, a, a highway, Highway I-81 that was, or Interstate I-81 that was um, sort of uh, developed in the middle of their community. It displaced this community. And um, although the community still stands today, that um, interstate is also still there. And it, um, it, 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 it brings a lot of um, environmental and uh, climate change um, impacts and issues um, in that community. So um, due to the uh, current administration, or I should say the current administration is looking at um, giving this community back their land or their space. And um, these students learned um, about the history of this um, community and their environmental impacts. And um, they were also able to learn about the new developments um, that will take place um, in Syracuse, New York, in the historic 15th Ward. And then also just recently um, in the city of Detroit, I traveled and was a part of a uh, toxic tour. Um, and this is a toxic tour that takes place in one of the uh, most toxic uh, communities or zip codes in uh, Michigan, 48217, uh, where we learned about um, this sort of uh, environmental degradation of this community due to industrialization that has taken place. Um, and I do have a video that I would like to show, a just quick video of that. Um, and then just other opportunities, uh, the students that traveled with me to Syracuse, New York, to learn about um, environmental issues in um, the historic uh, uh, 15th Ward, we were also um, privileged to travel to um, Niagara Falls, and also um, there's communities there that uh, suffer from um, environmental injustice and environmental justice as well. And then just some other mm -hmm. um, examples of community ways that you can um, engage your uh, students like I did mine um, in the community. So I have just images here from um, the most recent Grand River cleanup. I think I have an image there uh, related to invasive, uh, an invasive pool in Kalamazoo and um, other uh, class trips, um, field trips that we've taken to Yankee Springs and uh, Long Lake Outdoor Center. So just some examples here of um, environmental justice lessons, um, experiential learning lessons that um, my uh, students engaged in, and you can um, do the same for your students as well. And so uh, with that, I just have uh, some uh, videos in popular media that I use to um, engage my students. Um, and, and in these videos, a lot of these videos, there's a lot of terms related to environmental justice, environmental justice concerns. You'll um, learn about the community leaders and some of their issues. Um, I won't have time to show the uh, multiple videos that I have, but um, if I have a time, I'll show a couple here. Okay, we'll start with this one. This is um, a federal um, policy work that uh, with an organization climate action chain climate action campaign sorry that I worked with um, and this is just one of their um, recent uh, media promotions that they put out that I would typically share with um, my students to learn about policy and these issues um, but this very first one here um, is just a video uh, discussing the issue with soot and um, it's a federal policy issue. Uh, we're looking for the uh, EPA and looking forward to the EPA and the Biden administration to pass some of the um, most uh, of the historic uh, climate change legislation. Um, so again, this is just to teach policy in the classroom around a specific issue. Uh, here, I have another video. Um, the journey to justice. So this is a video that would educate students about 
the current EPA uh, administrator, Michael Regan. Uh, also note that uh, he's an African American uh, working in a very prestigious position. Uh, this is something that you would like to make note to your students uh, and just his journey um, learning about environmental justice communities across the nation um, and his journey with that. Um, I do have a video um, specifically with Teresa Landrum. I was just with her in Detroit um, where we did the toxic tour in the city of Detroit, Detroit's uh, Michigan's most polluted zip code, 48217. Um, so this is just a model for advocacy in Michigan and a whole host of concepts and terms that students can learn from. Um, and then I had a really nice video that I wanted to show you about a community in um, Highland Park that um, transitioned from blight to um, beauty. And so um, this uh, advocate here, Mama Shu, she uh, redeveloped a block in um, Highland Park, Michigan. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Highland Park, Michigan, but Highland Park traditionally does, um, or as of late, they don't have any street lights. Um, so they're using solar, um, solar panels to um, generate streets for this particular block. And um, they're gonna be used as a model. They build a schoolhouse on this particular block. Um, and she was on the Ellen Show. Ellen donated a home on this particular block. Um, it's a, just a really inspiring story. This is someone who um, lost three of her sons to tragedy. Um, in the city of Detroit, she tells that story, and um, due to that, it's motivated her to want to educate um, children, um, make Highland Park and the Detroit region area better, and they incorporate a lot of sustainability concepts, uh, renewable technology, um, just sustainability, climate change, and all of the like. So, um, so with that, I think I'll end and say thank you for my time, and I'm, I can share all of this with you all. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Hello, everyone. <laughs> My name is Christine Renner, and I'm the Vice Provost for Instructional Development and Innovation at Grand Valley State University. And it is my distinct pleasure to help introduce our next speaker, D Dr. Denise Keel. Dr. Keel serves as Director of the Michigan Climate Action Network, an organization dedicated to establishing Michigan as a leader in equitable climate solutions and supporting a just transition to a resilient future. Given her expertise in so many areas, including environmental policy, law, politics, and her deep experience in higher education, teaching at both the undergraduate and graduate level, and her deep exp experience as a scholar, and also in climate action planning and co community coalition building, it is really an honor and a delight to have her here at the conference for her presentation, Connecting Education to Climate Action in Michigan. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Keel. Well, well, thank you so much, everyone, uh, for being here. You know you're in the right place um, when your former students are giving the talk before you. So if you didn't uh, catch that, I know we always get the awe for that. We'll take, we'll take selfies later with everyone. Uh, so so uh, I want to talk to you about uh, a, a lot of things uh, this evening, this afternoon. Uh, the one thing I will not talk to you about is that picture of the state capitol there, right? So if you don't know, uh, right now there are a bevy of bills in the Michigan legislature, um, and I'm kind of honored to not have to talk about them with you all tonight, frankly. We've been working on these for a few months, and I'm absolutely available at the dinner table, um, in the networking spaces to talk about those. But I really wanted to focus tonight 
on the things that we can do together in education and in climate. You know, when I first started, um, took over the Michigan Climate Action Network, uh, it's been just a year and a half now coming from academia. At first I thought, well, don't, you know, you can't lean into the education thing. And I've kind of uh, come back to that. Why wouldn't I, right? Um, all of those experiences and all of those things. And I often say that I'm a former educator, but I've learned and all those teachers out there know you never stop being a teacher, and it is a very transferable and valuable skill to climate action, number one. And where I think about my trajectory now is uh, as students. I think we are all students in this time. We, you know, we have a futurist here tonight to walk us through scenarios. We really don't know. And we have to give ourselves the ability to learn and grow together. And that's really what the, the Michigan Climate Action Network is about. And the things I want to talk to you about th this afternoon are some of the beliefs and attitudes. I'm a political scientist, a social scientist, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how we view education and how educators view ourselves and what we're te actually teaching or not about climate change. And then I want to talk a little bit about the collaborative partnerships. We're, we're all here in one tonight. and to we raise a call to action about how we can further connect ourselves across the state um, through organizations like MICAM. Uh, and lastly, I want to show a little bit of our higher education report. If you're out at our table, uh, one of the things we just released was what are our 15 public universities doing around climate change and around climate action, especially on their campuses. So those are things I am going to talk to you uh, about today. Oh, and I'm, I'm, my notes say to not forget that we will also be speaking tomorrow at 2 p.m. on the online virtual piece. So um, if you miss something today or we don't get a chance to connect, uh, please join my colleagues at 2 p.m. on the online session tomorrow. We'll be continuing this conversation about how we collaborate and work better and stronger together. Mm -hmm. So just a, a touch about our organization, the Michigan Climate Action Network. We're about 100 different affiliates, so organizations across the state join us. And one of the ways that you should think about that is, for instance, our Kalamazoo Climate uh, Crisis Coalition that I founded and led. We're about 40 affiliates, right? And so when the Kalamazoo Climate Crisis Coalition or the Grand Rapids Climate Coalition, which is like 60, 80 something, a lot, when they join MICAN, think about that groundswell of support that we are really representing in all of those groups and individuals. And our mission is to connect all of us, to amplify, support, and connect so that we can keep doing all of the bold work. We have uh, did some strategic planning about a year ago now, and really our core role is to amplify to be the megaphone uh, of this movement and to, to make sure all of your good work is being out there. And then that supporting role is connection. And that's, again, really why we're here, to make sure that all the educators and students are, are connected and be able to support each other. Our overall goal is that those activities then lead into the state plan. Right? We do have a My Healthy Climate Plan. It has really good goals. We're going to need to work very hard together in order to achieve those. And so it's our intention to build an educated, coordinated network that can achieve what and meet and exceed the goals that we currently have for this state. So that's just a little bit about who we are. And I'm going to show, now, show you now some of the beliefs and attitudes, all right? So a little social science uh, graph fun. Hmm? The good news, um, if you don't pay attention to these kinds of things, is that we are the, the majority. If you're not familiar with the Yale School on Climate Change Communication, it is a fantastic resource for educators, for polling data, for political scientists. And one of the, the things that they have done since 2013 is polled folks and put them into what they call the six global warming Americas. And so across your screen are the alarmed and the concerned, right? Those of us probably in this room with the, the most uh, belief we are out there trying to do things, we are motivated, all the way over to our dismissives, the lowest belief in, in climate change and global warming, not acting, right? Because of course we don't believe that. Now here's the good news. That alarmed and concerned category since 2013 has more than doubled. If you can do the math and put those two numbers together, that's 59% of the population that is motivated, thinks this is a serious problem, thinks we need to be doing something. I like to look at that and say, that's like six out of every 10 people you meet in any room, right? The numbers in Michigan are very similar. 70% of us believe. I know we don't like that word, right? Uh, we believe in climate change. You can talk to seven out of 10 people in Michigan, right? Not every room, 
but most rooms on the average. The other good news is those, that dismissive category hasn't actually changed very much. It stayed at around, I think the highest ever was recorded was about 11%. It stayed around 9 or 10% of the population for this whole time. We had uh, Bill McKibben come speak at Western Michigan University in 2015, the year we created our climate change working group on campus. And I'll never forget his speech, because at the time I was doing research on how do we talk to these climate deniers? How are we going to convince them? What do we do, right? That was, the, that was all scholarship was focused on that. And so he got asked that question, right? He asked Bill McKibben, the founder of 350.org, well, how do you talk to climate denialists? And he said, I don't. And I sort of woke up, right? I was out there like you in that audience that night. I said, OK, why not? He said, well, they're not going to change their minds. And he's absolutely right, as usual, right? That same 9% of the population is out there. Guess what? That's less than the people that believe that the Earth is flat. So hmm, we got that going for us, right? <laughs> They're not going to change their mind. And so our whole intent, and my intent with MICAN, is to instead focus on the folks who are the majority. You want and need things to do. And those are the folks we take a very positive and solutions-oriented approach here at MICAN. All right, a little bit of bad news. So if you're with me on these six Americas, this is again from the Yale uh, pieces. At the top there are six Americas again. Uh, the math is a little different than the slide I just showed you because what they did was compile all the answers to their surveys from 2013 to 2022. And they came up with 24% of the American population is super alarmed. We are in this fight. The unfortunate news is that we all suffer from something called the attitude behavior gap, is what social scientists call this. Of that alarmed group, not so many of us are participating. 34% of the alarmed are the folks really out there taking action. If you do the math, that comes out to about 8% of the US population. The original uh, environmental movement in the United States in the 70s, somewhere around 10 to 12 percent. There's social science research that says we only need 3.5 percent of the population, but I'm here to tell you that's not true. It's not working, right? We don't have enough folks out there acting. Now, there are barriers to this, right? Mm -hmm. What I would love for us to all continue to focus on, look at this category of almost half of the folks who are alarmed are willing to take action. What's stopping them, right? Sometimes it's knowledge and skills, all the things that we're here to do as educators, who to talk to, what to say, what do I even do? But a lot of times it is the social norm. It is this idea that we are actually not the majority. And that's what I want to spend just a little time talking through. Right now, those active folks, only half of them think that there is a social norm hmm, to take action on climate. What do I mean by that? Who rode their bike here, right? Who walked here? Who rid the, did public transportation? Why are we having a vegan buffet tonight, right? Those actions make a difference. If we're not perceiving that the rest of our world is kind of with us, we're very social creatures, right? We want to make sure that we're, we're in the, the cool gang, right, for a good climate joke, right? I know, it takes a minute. We're not even talking about it. About a third of us talk about climate change on a regular basis, right? And what's fascinating to me is this wonderful study by, in Nature, the Nature Journal, that came out in 2022. I'm going to read their um, uh, analysis because I want to make sure I get the numbers right. But the concept here in social science is something called pluralistic ignorance. The definition of pluralistic ignorance is that we describe a false social reality. There's a near universal perception of public opinion that is actually the opposite of the true public sentiment. That's what's going on with climate change. Specifically, 80 to 90 percent of Americans underestimate the prevalence of support for major climate change mitigation policies and climate concern. Again, 60 to 80% of Americans support policies, want to take action, know that we need to be doing something. When we are asked how much we think our colleagues and friends support climate action, we only answer at about 30%. So again, this, this, 
80% of us believe. I only think 30% of you do, so I don't really talk about it, right? So I don't want to bring it up in that circle or in that class because I don't want to have to go there and get into it, right? That norm has to change. And that is something that we can do by supporting each other and by talking about it and by staying connected. Back to good news. We're the majority again. This is the, uh, the North American Association for Environmental Education. They asked teachers and administrators, hey, so do you think there's a responsibility to teach climate change? Do you want to be teaching climate change? And that's the graph over here on the, the left. Teachers in the yellow, of course, 74% say, I want to be uh, involved. I want to be doing this in my classroom. Administrators, 80%. And thank you to the administrators that are here tonight. I, I said this to you privately, it's worth saying publicly, that support for teachers from your administration means the world. And I bet a lot of teachers are out there thinking, well, that's not my administrator. Well, 80% of them in the national survey say they want you to teach climate too. We're not talking about this together in ways that are constructive, right? Over there on the right is the Yale data again. When we ask public, should your, should your children be taught climate change, science, education in schools? The answer is overwhelmingly yes. 77% of Michiganders say we should be teaching it in all schools, K through 12 and higher education. But again, it doesn't feel like that, right? When we ask teachers you know, about, about some of these other pieces, just like the attitude behavior gap, there's a confidence gap, is what it's called in the education parlance. So all of us want to teach it, right? 74% are saying, we want to teach this. How many of us actually are on a regular basis? Only 39%. Granted, there are always other barriers, right? Uh, many barriers to changing that course and bringing this content in the classroom. But we're not matching that up. And when we ask teachers, when NAAAE asked teachers why, it was a skills gap on the teacher's part. I don't feel confident enough to do that in my classroom. That's something that we as educators can absolutely address together. The same cognitive dissonance or pluralistic ignorance also ex exists among teachers and administrators for their beliefs about the perceptions of the parents that are out there in that district. Again, seven out of 10 people believe in climate change and want you to be teaching it to your students. But when I ask you in a survey, do you think how many parents want me to teach it? Administrators put that at uh, about probably half of my parents. Teachers only think a quarter of the public supports them in teaching climate. That is not okay and it's not true, right? We are operating out of a false perception. We gotta flip that script, and the more of us that talk about it and connect and support each other in this work, that's what's going to make that cultural norm change. So uh, I, I see my colleagues out here from Michigan Alliance from Environmental Outdoor Educator. There are a couple in the room tonight. Uh, we formed a bit of a partnership, and if you can click the QR code, we have our own Michigan survey that follows the questions from the NAAAE going on right now. It is still open and available. Get those phones up. I love to see that. Uh, what our preliminary results are already saying it's mirroring the, the national data, right? 84% of Michigan teachers so far in our survey say, yeah, we want to be teaching climate change. When we ask, are you, how much climate are you actually being able to include? And this is this open K through 12 and higher ed. How much inclusion is really happening? It's uh, the same thing. Sporadic is about half of, uh, half of folks. Infrequent, 19%. 26%, not at all. Yet they want to. Right, the same similar skills gap, confidence gap, attitude behavior gap is stopping us from doing the things that we know we should be doing as educators. This is our climate education action team. Uh, I gave a version of this talk to the Michigan Alliance for Environmental Outdoor Educators Conference a year ago. We just got connected again this last year and have really been trying to pull together a team along with the, the environmental education at our state agency, Environment, Great Lakes, and Energy, right? To build those resources out together and to start to discuss these different pieces. The mission of that group is to support educators. 
We want to deliver the highest quality interdisciplinary climate change education to develop and form and engage citizens. And we have to do this in a few ways. Again, if we have a skills and competence and attitude behavior gap, we better be really curating some great resources for folks. And then we better be training our teachers. We need to be teaching each other, right? Don't let that confidence gap um, share us. We're all students, remember? And if we start with that, it gets a little easier. We also think um, some of those standards, right? When we ask the Michigan teachers, well, what's stopping you? Uh, it's not just the skills gap, it's also time, and it's the standards, right? And so we gotta do some work together to think about what Michigan education policy looks like and how all that feeds into building the best state plan that we can have. We've thought a little bit about some of the different roles. You know, what's the role of a state agency and the, the land that they hold, the science that they hold? What's the role of community partners and non-governmental organizations like myself, uh, providing that community action space, um, being able to form a network, right, and, and do those kinds of skills is so important. And non-formal and formal educators as well. We need the place-based, all the experiential uh, pieces that Deirdre was just talking about. And this needs to be interdisciplinary, right? That is the other big focus of this work. I know we're starting with environmental educators, but you know now know my political philosophy, right? You start with the people who really care and who really know, and that's how you build and grow a movement. And so we need to expand that beyond science and math, right? I was so pleased to hear uh, your provost speak about the different areas that are contributing, right? Because we also have uh, Eco-anxiety. I'm sure you're, if you're a teacher, I see everyone nodding, you're experiencing this with your students. We, this has to be in the arts, in music, in drama, in poetry, right, for us to have the heart of a real movement. One of the things that Michigan Climate Action Network does along that line of, of cultural connections, how we utilizing these pieces to transform education, is we follow the model from the American Psychological Association on Climate Cafes. And we now have an artistic director who made these amazing mural banners for our last climate summit. And there are questions associated with each of them about what are you going to love about that future? in which we address climate change. And you get to write down hmm, your feelings. What does your community need right now? How are you feeling, right? Without taking that part of the space in our learning, we're missing out hmm, on a huge a human intrinsic motivator. Hmm? The other pieces that Michigan Climate Action Network really tries to do, how we build this support, uh, a couple years ago we wrote a report on the communities that are leading on climate change. Right? And you can see that across the state, there are at least 20 different communities that have a Grand Rapids Climate Coalition, right? A Kalamazoo one, a Traverse City one, a Marquette, an Oakland County, a Royal Oak, I can go on. Those folks, and when I was in that position, didn't know each other. And the same is true, I just shared a little bit, we've done this higher education report on the 15 public universities in Michigan, right? The Deirdres and the Elenas here at their universities are working sometimes in a vacuum still, right? I didn't know about, I knew maybe about some of the other folks at universities, but I certainly didn't talk to them regularly, connect with them about what we were trying to do, uh, learn from each other, right? That's what Michigan Climate Action Network seeks to do and to try to build some of those state tables so that we can be talking to each other. Again, our whole goal is to make sure this state is a leader in climate and justice policies. I'll just share um, a little bit from the uh, report here, and you can get that online. It's at our table out here as well. Um, you know, we focused on some of the campus sustainability pieces, right? What are these universities doing with their own buildings? As Dr. Alexander, who you're going to hear from in a minute, really eloquently puts, you know, we're at like a, basically a little mini city here right, and being on GVSU's campus. That has incredible impacts of its own in the community and on climate. So one of the things we wanted to look at was how many universities have a carbon neutrality goal or a climate action plan? And of our 15 public universities, it turns out six do, right? University of Michigan, Michigan State University, Wayne State, GVSU, thank you, right? Or might not have done that slide, no. Uh, Western Michigan University and Northern Michigan University all have made formal commitments to how they're going to achieve that piece. Most of these commitments, interestingly enough, are made within the last five years or so, right? The momentum to do this and the people that are making it happen is growing and growing. 
we connected these folks for the first time in this report and in a, a session last May, you know, they had not talked to each other about how they were doing that work. And you can sometimes feel pretty lonely on your campus. And I'm here to tell you it's not true and that we should be connecting with each other across the state. Hmm? Oh, I, I would be remiss if I didn't note uh, the real author of that report, Brendan Seguin Mortensen, a student at Western Michigan University in a wonderful role reversal. I got to be the community partner that mentored the intern rather than the faculty member that was usually trying to check on the host site. So that was a lot of fun and, and most of that report is really owed to his research and great work with us. The other piece that we looked at was the network, right? Because that's what we're really interested in mapping out. And so we asked and researched, who are the faculty groups at your university? Who are the student groups? In all of our 15 public universities, there is a, a lot of different groups, right? There usually is a faculty group, uh, Office for Sustainability uh, type of piece, right? Something in finance and business, somewhere in there. And then there's your student groups. And students, I see some students out here. I know a lot of my talk is framed towards the, the educators, the teachers in the room. But if we're all students, I can tell you from my experience here, I'll, I'll flip so there are more, all the universities are on there so you can find yours and find your group. The thing that I really learned in doing this work at Western Michigan University was that the student voices were more powerful than mine most days. And so students who are out there, you know, this is your call to action to push your faculty and your administration on the pieces that you know, right? Your future is the most imperiled in this. And we need to be doing a lot more to listen to our students on this issue. And I just can't, you know, uh, be remiss without thanking our hosts here and the network that's already been created, right? We're not seeking to replace this wonderful work. I want to instead build on uh, what Elena has been doing with the Climate Change Education Solutions Network, right? This mission has been around since 2018 to connect most of West Michigan. My goodness, right? As we've been colleagues and kindred spirits for many years now. Um, and it's my dream to just take this to the state level now and to make sure we are all really connected. And I'll end with, you know, what is climate education for? And, and hopefully this will be a good, good segue into pieces. Um, in Dr. Alexander's book, he breaks out the different sections that we tend to work on, right? What's our campus about? We've shown you a little bit about our research and work on that. Uh, curriculum we haven't touched yet. There's, there's great programs like ASHI that, that, that do that for us. Creative expression, right? Or, or research. Where, where is that piece? this community connection. And the thing that I would add is collaboration. How are we going to help each other do this work? That is what the Michigan Climate Action Network um, is here to support you in doing. Um, and I just put, you know, I love an academic, can't get away without putting some book titles on your slides, so I'm glad Deirdre also did that. Because um, I really, most of you probably read Sand County Almanac, right? Um, and came away with the adage that I used for many years in my career, if we just teach folks to love it, they will protect it. Right, you all know that, and that's true. What I find is if I had to, you know, critique Dr. Leopold, sorry, we no longer know how to protect, right? If you love it, you'll protect it. What we're seeing, right, is if you love it, you wanna protect it, but you don't know how, you think you're the only one, you don't have the skills, you don't know what to do. We have, I think, lost this mission of teaching folks how to advocate, organize, do many, many pieces in our curriculum, right? David Orr got it a little bit more right. Uh, many of you probably know that's where I stole the title, what is education for? His 1991 essay still holds up. All education is environmental education. If you haven't read Adrian Marie Brown, Emergent Strategy, always a lesson, never a failure. We gotta think a little bit differently about how we learn and what we learn. Braiding sweetgrass, Robin Wall Kimmerer tells us plants are teachers. Everything's a teacher. And of course, we're gonna hear from Universities on Fire and Dr. Alexander in just a minute. But I took great um, inspiration from your work. And I think that's all I got. This is our Climate Education Action Team from the Michigan uh, Association for Alliance for Environmental Outdoor Educators and me at that conference uh, back in Alpena just a little bit ago. And we did all, you know, make sure we wore green uh, for that particular uh, photo. So come join us in my can. Come talk to me after whatever you need. Thank you so much for the time uh, and ability to speak with you today. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Okay. 
It gives me a great pleasure and honor to introduce our um, keynote speaker, Dr. Brian Alexander. This is the second time I introduce him in two days. Yay for me. <laughs> So uh, Dr. Alexander is an internationally known futurist, researcher, educator, um, writer, uh, and his work centers around the, the field of how technology transforms education. So a very broad topic. Um, he has a PhD from the University of Michigan in English language and literature. And uh, so he received his PhD in 1997. I didn't write the date, I think that's about right. Um, he taught literature, writing, multimedia, and information technology studies at Centenary College of Louisiana. From 2012 to 2014, he worked at the National Institute for Technology in Liberal Arts Education, a nonprofit. Um, supporting colleges and universities integrating digital technology. Dr. Alexander is known internationally for writing and speaking um, on, uh, in many venues. He writes for The Atlantic, for Inside Higher Ed. He is a very often um, invited to speak on topics around education by NPR. Um, uh, and a number of other uh, news channels. I know many of us are very well familiar with him because he has a podcast to which he invites um, writers, educators on a diversity of topics in higher education. Um, and he was our uh, guest speaker yesterday at the inaugural presidential uh, forum. And, um, and we were all very excited to have him on campus, to have him be uh, the speaker, and, uh, very, and so looking forward to the keynote today. Please help me welcome him to the stage. Thank you, Thank you so much uh, for that very kind introduction. Uh, and hello to everybody. I'm very, very glad to see you. Uh, I live in the Washington, D.C. area, but I lived for many years in southeast Michigan. So I know about winter. Uh, I know about construction season. Uh, I know about the great powers of Verner's and Fago. Um, my wife's family is from downriver just south of Detroit, so I know what Fermi 2 can do to people. Um, and uh, I know where I am when I'm on, you know, <laughs> playing this thing. Uh, how many of you are faculty? How many of you are staff? How many of you are students? Hello, students. How many of you are something else completely? Whoa, 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 that's excellent, that's excellent. What are you, just throw it out. C4. C4, yes, which is a explosive, yes? <laughs> yes. Now for the rest of you. Excellent, excellent. Architect, terrific. I'm sorry? Excellent. Excellent. Well, this is a really open and diverse crowd. This is terrific. I'm so glad to hear that. Government. Which one? USDA. Ah, I think you, your voice went down a little bit when you said it the second time. It was like, government, <laughs> USDA. <laughs> All right. Excellent. Excellent. Innovator. Just in general? Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Oh, very good. Very good. And you? Wow, that's quite a lot to put your arms around. Yes. What great timing. <laughs> excellent, excellent. We need more of you. Um, well, this is terrific. Uh, I love the way that uh, climate change can really just cut across normal barriers and bring people together across all kinds of domains. Uh, what I'd like to do is talk about talk about the clicker, that's what I want to talk about. Um, I want to talk about what climate change can do with higher education and vice versa. And to do this, I'm going to cover a lot of ground, which is appropriate given the intellectual and professional personal diversity shown here in this room. Uh, so to begin with, I'm a futurist. Um, this is a fun meme. I don't know if you've seen this before. It's pretty good. This, they do this for different professions, but it's pretty accurate. Um, you know, the top left 
is what people think of me. In fact, I got into trouble for this. My previous book, Academia Next, uh, I wrote this in 2017, 2019, has this little chapter on thinking about the future of higher education. And there's one page, uh, page 23, which is now notorious, um, where I say, imagine what would happen if a pandemic struck the world. What would that do to higher education? And about six months after the book came out, people have been after me, you know, wondering, you know, what I know, uh, what dark forces I was in league with. And also, I do a lot of work in technology, uh, as our, our wonderful provost got to uh, mention. But the bottom is really what I do. I'm all about curiosity, about exploring the future, and helping people uh, think in those ways. So this is uh, one of my books uh, where I talk about the future of American higher education. And this came out, and besides scaring heck, the heck out of people, this also got some attention. And it made me think, all right, I want to do for a follow-up book. I want to focus on the future of global higher education. What can I focus on? And as I was working on this, I realized that almost nobody was talking about climate change in higher education. That if you looked at conferences, if you looked at papers, if you looked at journalism, climate change was just pretty quiet. And the more I dug into it, the more I thought this was strange and that needed to be addressed. And the futurist community, we treat climate change as a given. That not mentioning climate change would be like not mentioning economics or gravity. So that's where this came out. And uh, I've, I've been on the road touring this uh, and talking with people about this. And I have all kinds of things to report. But what I'd like to do is to take you through what I found in my research uh, that went into the book and what I've been re working on since. And first, I want to take a look at the short term, uh, within a decade or so, and then I want to look a little further out uh, towards the second half of the 21st century. So as I go, please think of comments and questions, think of examples, because we'll have time to talk about them, uh, perhaps in the panel as well as afterwards. So I, I don't need to tell you um, that uh, climate change's reality is being felt this year. Uh, this is one example. This is from uh, NASA taking a look at global temperatures over this past year compared to previous years. Anything that's colored yellow or orange or red was hotter than it had been in the historical record. So you can see that's everywhere except a bit of Antarctica and not even all of Antarctica. Uh, this is a similar map taking a look at climate events over the past year. And the reason I have this up here is partly it's interesting and informative, but also, if you look around all these different countries that are experiencing increased heat, Japan, South Africa, uh, most of uh, you know, the Arctic, almost every one of those locations has colleges and universities in it already. So all of those campuses have been exposed to higher temperatures. And that's not all that we mean. When we think about climate change, really there are about three different levels of impact. One of them is the direct impact of the environment on our physical and, and biological uh, materials. The second is following events that are taking place in the natural world after that natural world has been hit by climate change. And the third is how humans react. And all three of these impinge on colleges and universities. So let's think about the first one. Now, we think about what happens when the natural world strikes our campuses. What kind of damage, what kind of pressure, what kind of threats these are. And this is a good way to start. Uh, you've all seen, I think, similar maps to this, where you think about what would happen if uh, sea level rise continues to a certain degree. And if you look around here, let me see, oops, let's not look around there. Um, if you take a look at the east coast of the United States here, you can just run your eye down it, and you can see that uh, Boston is now more coastal than it was. You look down to New York, and you can see New York is more exposed. And if you go further south, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., suddenly the ocean really starts gaining. Norfolk ends up being an island. Charleston ends up being an island. Florida ceases to exist. And if you look at New Orleans, there's now an inland sea from there. And if you look at the west coast, uh, San Francisco becomes the gateway to an inland sea as well. And San Diego now has an ocean creeping up behind it. Now, I, I'm mentioning this because think of how many campuses are involved. Think of, you know, take a look at the Northeast, which is just chock a block with all kinds of universities and colleges. Think about how many have to face this. In fact, uh, for an example, we can take a look at uh, Miami Dade County. Uh, which is a fascinating example. It's one of the more extreme cases in the US. They suffer from something called daylight flooding now. Has anyone been there and experienced this? What was that like? You're walking through water in the middle of the street. When it's daylight. Yeah. 
<laughs> there's no rain. <laughs> there's no flooding per se, and the city just floods anyway. See, it's built at sea level. It's built on limestone. It's a disaster in many ways. This is the US government Corps of Engineers trying to figure out a way to help reduce some of the damage. This is an incredibly expensive plan. It won't protect the city. The idea is just to make it flood a bit less. But the reason I'm mentioning it here is because these are where colleges and universities are, all over the place, just blocks away. In fact, we can zoom in and we can see here, there's about a half a dozen literally on the beach. And so you have to think, I'm a futurist, I have to think this way, but if you're a professor, if you're a president, if you're a board member, you have to think five years from now, 10 years from now, should we start elevating our buildings? You know, on concrete pilings so the water rushes underneath them. Or do we think about building a seawall? Or do we think about moving to another state that will actually continue to exist? And this is an extreme case. This is an edge case, but it's not alone. Now, the flip side of all this water is to think about dryness, aridity, desertification. And one way of thinking about climate change globally is that areas that have lots of water will get too much water, and places that don't have enough water will get even less. So just take a look quickly at the, you know, the burning white and yellow places where there's actual desert. And look around their edges where it's orange and red and things that are fairly arid. And just realize that right now, there are a ton of campuses there, everywhere from Egypt to Australia to the American Southwest. And this, these temperatures are increasing, aridification is increasing, and you have to think of what that means to a college or university when, for example, people will be more likely to suffer heat stroke or they can't guarantee water quality. On top of this, my book's title is partially about literal fires. Uh, there's one campus I wrote about that has reorganized itself completely because it is hit with fires so often. They brush hogged a huge forest around them. They clear cut an area directly around the campus to reduce the chances of it uh, crossing over. They built a helipad for the helicopter that's necessary to fly over and put out fires. Their staff and faculty are cross trained with local fire departments. They're doing a pretty good job. We have to worry about literal fires as well as figurative ones. Second, layer. When I mentioned after all that impact, and we could talk about other impacts as well, including tsunamis and so forth, but think about the second impact. When nature strikes nature, nature changes. So we have, full, uh, we have flora that can no longer live in certain areas and appear elsewhere. Animals migrate, and that has all kinds of impact. That impacts our agriculture, that impacts the, what our buildings look and feel like, what our lands look like, and even affects diseases. This is a map of Lyme disease which was named after a town in Connecticut. Now Lyme has migrated because the deer ticks that it's based on have also migrated because of temperature changes. So we have to expect, among other things, changes in where diseases come and go. And our experience of COVID shows that we don't have a great time of it. Furthermore, those changes impact us in a very intimate way. Uh, already psychologists are trying to figure out what happens to the human mind when years later, you look back at your childhood and that environment no longer exists. You know, the trees you remember are gone, the colors you remember are different. They coined the term solastalgia for this. There's also terms like environmental trauma and psychological distress from this. And on top of that, I just have any excuse to show this photo. I love this photo to death. You know, we have the then President Trump uh, pursued by the then teenager uh, Greta Thunberg. And the reason I mention this is because of the third dimension, the human dimension. As our governments respond with regulation, as politicians respond with programs, uh, nonprofits and businesses respond, as consumers change their behavior, we change what we do and how we act. And that impacts colleges and universities. For example, we have a whole body of literature talking about what to do about our economics, because possibly our economics helped get us in this position. So maybe we should rethink capitalism. Madness in the US, other countries are more serious about it. So if we rethink, for example, in terms of donut economics, by Donald Rayworth's point of view, if we think about zero growth or degrowth economics, those have powerful impacts on higher education. And if we think about what happens to our politics, for example, this book here, Climate Leviathan, tries to imagine what happens to political sovereignty, what happens to a nation when the nation is subjected to climate, and perhaps when we have supranational organizations that try to organize things. Again, that impacts public universities directly and a lot of private ones as well. So I break this down 
into a few different domains. Think of them as buckets by which climate change and higher ed intersect. Uh, and one, uh, one of them is the physical grounds of the campus, a second is the research environment, a third is the teaching and learning mission, and a fourth is what a lot of you have been doing and talking about here, which is communications between town and gown, breaching the boundary between the uh, ivory tower and the rest of the planet. So let me just touch through these. And again, think about this in terms of the next, say, five to 10 years first. And when we do that, we can think about what changes on a physical, a physical campus, what happens to how it works and how it functions. One thing to think about is what happens to buildings like this. Do you actually get a campus where the buildings look different because they have been rebuilt and redesigned? Everything from using LEED standards and STAR standards, and we could talk about all of these, but basically making sure your buildings emit less CO2 in their lifespan. Uh, from construction to their operation. We think too about electrical power, uh, where the electricity comes into a campus, what it's sourced from. How many campuses in the US depend on oil and gas for their power? We don't really know. There's no really good data on this yet. I hope to help some other people uh, develop that. But you can resource that into renewables, or you can put renewables on your campus, depending on where you are. Michigan, I know you all love, love wind chill in winter, man. but turning that into a force for good uh, through wind turbines, uh, covering the state with solar, for example, which may or may not work on days like today, eh, so, so, using, other, you know, using hydropower and so on. Uh, further, you think about transportation. Uh, one of our guests was speaking about, you know, how did you get here today? Did you get here on foot or by bike and so on? Well, campuses have lots of transportation needs. They own a fleet and people come to them in cars and other vehicles. So how can a campus change that and try and decarbonize all the travel? And beyond that, Information technology, and this is my chance to say hello to people who are recording this. Thank you for your service. This is great. Um, I hope I'm not running around too much so I can stay in the frame. Uh, but do we, on the one hand, expand our use of IT because we do that to replace physical travel, or do we do less IT because some IT burns a lot of carbon? Now, beyond that, you can think of food. I, I, I used to think that this was the third rail, that food would be the most difficult thing to talk about. I was completely wrong. I thought, you know, the American diet produces a ton of CO2 and emits a ton of methane, so everyone knows the solution is to reduce the amount of animals and animal products and move towards a plant-based diet. And I thought that would be controversial. It's not yet, although I say that, I'll probably get attacked for it, but, and then basic needs of campuses. When we think about students who are here who are food insecure, housing insecure, how do you support them in a way that doesn't make climate change worse? And how do you move your campus? It's not easy to do, uh, or in this case, some of your campuses. Uh, how do you relocate somewhere else? Uh, my alma mater, the University of Michigan in the 1970s, tried to move north and they kind of ran out of money halfway through and ended up splitting the campus, which is a little awkward, but how do you relocate a giant research institution or a community college? Furthermore, second bucket, second domain. The, perhaps the most visible thing that colleges and universities do for the climate crisis is we do research. If you look at the IPCC reports, there's a ton of academic research there. The scholarly literature is filled with fields from chemistry to meteorology to hydrology, earth sciences, people are trying really hard to figure out what's happening now and modeling it for the future. And this is a great, great function that we perform. So we should expect more of that, looking ahead 10 years. More and more researchers doing more and more work, dare I say, doing dissertations, uh, and then continuing to publish research and share it which is a great thing. It also means, where'd our provost go? I just saw, hello. She gets to help support you in doing that when you are a researcher doing all this work. We also may have new domains appear or more subdisciplines. And beyond that, depending on how we respond to climate change, we may see other fields actually shrink if they're not doing enough for that field. Now, I, I was picking on our, our, our good provost here because it's important to figure out how to support faculty doing this. I mean, think about supporting faculty when they research and the physical objects they're studying are difficult to reach or are destroyed. For example, if you have archeological objects, if you have uh, biological zones that you're studying, do we figure out a way to 3D image them? Do we move them? How do we reproduce that? 
And furthermore, how do you support faculty and staff doing research and students doing research when the politics are perhaps dangerous? Someone working in a state like, say, Texas or Florida. I got to give a talk like this to a bunch of public universities in Texas, and they told me, please, not to talk about climate change. They wanted to hear it, but they were afraid they would get in trouble with the state government. I, I did talk about it because I'm not a good person. I get in trouble all the time. Now, here is the third rail. And this surprised me, but I think this is in many ways um, the most controversial part of climate change in academia right now. We know that air travel is horrendous for the climate, that it gouts out CO2 like there's no tomorrow. And we don't have, unlike with cars or with ships, we don't have an easy replacement right now. People are working on it. We have hopes for this, but right now, you're still on Southwest and you're still just, you know, spewing out CO2 as you travel. So in Europe, they have the idea of fliegskam, Swedish word meaning flight shaming. So if someone's flying from, say, you know, Berlin to Vienna, you make fun of them saying, take a train, it's cheaper and it's easier. I do that instead. In the US, not so much because our train network is a mess. So do we do this? Do we ask academics to fly less? Because on the one hand, we know how. We did this all during the pandemic. The technology is there, the practices are there, it's easy to do, we can all do it, fine. Or do we do hybrid? high flex situations where we have someone speaking and presenting and we also have a virtual audience. We can do that. Grand Valley did that easily yesterday because Grand Valley has a lot of IT skills, which is great. But, but, there's resistance because on the one hand, this might not be fair to people who are early career and need to be physically immersed with a lot of people in order to build networks. It's also unequal for other reasons, too. We may have resistance as well because this kind of travel is valuable to academics. We like the emotional connection, we like the greater interpersonal bandwidth, and sometimes it's fun. So this might be something that we have to struggle with. By the way, have any of you used that technology in that photo there? There's no generic name for it. People usually nickname it Segway with an iPad stuck on top. <laughs> uh, the TV show Community did a couple episodes with it. Uh, I've been calling them Doppelbots. Nobody likes that name, so, yeah. Uh, but basically, it is an iPad on a stick, uh, and it's a way of doing telepresence computing. So when I was there, I was driving that Segway um, from miles and miles away, and I could zoom around and talk to people. It was pretty cool. Uh, so the thing that higher education is most known for, that we talk about the most, that we, uh, is kind of our mission, is teaching and learning. That's what people think of when they think about higher ed. So this is the third bucket, the third domain. We want to think about how we can teach and what we can teach differently. So right now, we could and should expand our teaching uh, across the curriculum, all fields in the humanities, the arts, the social sciences, the natural sciences. The student demand is there. We should supply that, which means colleges and universities have to think about expanding that curriculum and supporting instructors who do it. We may also see more programs and maybe climate centers pop up and we may see micro-credentials and other formal responses to this. That's the what we teach, the how we teach. Pedagogy may also change. I mean, what I'm doing right now, lecturing to you, is probably the least successful pedagogy humanity has ever developed. This is guaranteed to have low information transfer. I mean, I'm doing my best here, but it is a problem. Um, and in classes, maybe we should try things that are better at teaching earth science and complex systems. Project-based learning, inquiry-based learning are brilliant for a student to cross a bunch of intellectual domains from economics to geology in the pursuit of an idea. And furthermore, and this may make some of you happy, may make some of you embarrassed, I don't know, gaming is great for teaching complicated systems. Uh, we already have a bunch of tabletop games and computer games for teaching climate. Maybe we should do more. And beyond that, the students who come to your, let me just see the show of hands again, the students who are here. Yes, yes, you should, be, oh good, you put your hand wick. You have a beard, sir. You have much wisdom, excellent. Um, so students like this poor guy that I'm picking on, he's regretting coming here right now. Um, students like that um, all have the chance of pursuing a green job after graduation. And that might be an actual, what we think of as a green job, say working at installing and managing uh, wind turbines. It may be an old job that's repurposed for this, like electrical engineering. We need a lot more electrical engineers, so we're gonna modernize the entire North American grid, right? And it can also be more forward-looking or futuristic jobs where you try to help an organization, a nonprofit, a company, or a government, try to rethink and reimagine themselves in the climate change era. 
I mean, I hear this from companies all the time. They want people to help advise them on this. Colleges and universities can produce students who have that ability. And it might not be something that we do gently and smoothly. Uh, higher education has a long history of friction, and we also have a, an uneven history of student uprising and student pressure. I look at protests like this, and I look at signs like this, and I'm haunted by them. Take a look at that young woman's face, the intensity of that, and her slogan, you'll die of old age, we'll die of climate change. And tell me how comfortable she's going to be if a campus, not this one, but if a campus says to her, that's a good concern. We're going to start a 10-year planning process. At the end of that process, we'll have new plans. Do you think she'll be patient with that? Uh, this is Greta Thunberg's generation. This is the generation of the students in Europe who have been throwing food on works of art and gluing themselves to things to draw attention. Um, I think we may see more and more student demand and more perhaps student unrest. And it might not be about us. Think about what happens when a student leaves your campus and goes to an art gallery and does something as a protest. They're still your student. You have to support them. Right? This may be friction. This may be a hopefully creative and productive friction. We've already seen one example of this in Barcelona where students went on strike in order to compel the University of Barcelona to require climate classes of all students. We may see more of this. Furthermore, last bucket. I've been talking about campuses more or less in their ivory tower, within their walls, within their boundaries, within their centers. But campuses also interact with the larger world. And you can see that tonight, because there's so many of you here in and from the larger world who are working together with all of us, which is the only way forward. This is in many ways the calling of higher education for the rest of the century, is to break down that ivory tower and engage with the world and help the world forward. So in the immediate neighborhood, thinking about a, a town, thinking about a city or a county nearby, how can a campus assist that? How can a campus help with decarbonization? What kind of productive synergistic efforts can they do? I can name a bunch, but that's also the flip side is where can friction occur? Uh, where can people push back? In both ways, imagine, for example, a very conservative college where the town around them liberalizes or vice versa. Furthermore, beyond the immediate town, think about academia in the whole world. I mean, if this is the biggest crisis facing the human race for the rest of the century and beyond, perhaps academia has a responsibility to act and to act in public and in the world. So to have staff and faculty act as public intellectuals, sharing their research with the entire world, perhaps to have us try and do mitigation efforts, not just adapting, but maybe we put carbon sequestration devices on our campus, and that's controversial when we talk about that. Uh, maybe we participate with building projects, megastructures in the world. Maybe we support climate migrants. Uh, isn't that part of your dissertation work on migration? So thinking about what happens when millions of people hit the road, what's our job in trying to house or support them or to teach them? And maybe we form alliances. Maybe there's a global alliance of multiple campuses who are involved in this work. The six colleges and, and universities in Michigan that you showed take the lead on this. Okay, all of those things come together. That's why this is a complex problem, a big one. And I want to push things forward and then I want to stop so I can hear from uh, the rest of the panel. I'm going to skip that slide. Um, one thing that is hard to think about is where to start. And we have a lot of easy steps that people can take that are very, very small. Uh, I like to think about people who will say, who have money, who will buy a Tesla and say, okay, I'm doing my bit. Uh, here's the Washington Post saying, implicitly, you may as well give up, just get used to higher temperatures. Uh, they got mocked for this, I think rightly. Um, but that's one thing to do, is to figure out how to train yourself to go without so much air conditioning. Um, I think instead we can do something bigger. Uh, this is my friend Josh Kim at Inside Higher Ed. And he asks a university leader to prepare their school for the impacts of climate change, to be willing to elevate climate risk mitigation, both in investments of time and institutional status. So spending resources and making this central. Understanding the risks that climate change poses to the university and then developing plans to reduce the harm to students, faculty, or staff once climate-related events should occur should be at the core of institutional priorities and leadership operations. Most campuses are not doing this yet. Grand Valley is doing this right now. 
which is remarkable. There are a couple of other schools in the US, a few others in the world. I think this is the leading edge. This is the beginning. We're, right now, we're in the, just the, the, we're just wading into this bit by bit. And there are reasons why we don't do anything. And I could talk about, I'm gonna skip that because it's too depressing. Um, what I want you to think about is what happens over the next generation now. Let's press fast forward and look ahead a little bit further. And think, for example, what the world is going to be like. I mean, this is a complex problem, but we know that over the next 40 years, we should expect to see more heating, more flooding, more storms, more heat, more wet bulb temperature, more damages to people and to physical property all over the world. And in that case, the natural differences will start to appear. I mean, you'll see forests that die and are replaced by other kinds of grasses. You'll start to see more and more seacoast being nibbled away and so on. And of course, second and third tier impacts. Nature will be different, more weather crises, more damage, and campuses will be showing the imprints of these. And on the positive sides, we'll be rebuilding buildings, making them more carbon friendly. Maybe instead of having lawns, we'll have gardens and so on. We may also have political side effects. We may have state governments or national governments declaring states of emergency for better or for worse. We may see increasing political instability as policies have a hard time holding on. And we may see migration in the millions and tens of millions. And again, this is just early days for the climate crisis. I mean, you can take a look at geoengineering and wondering if countries start, or other actors, start taking steps to try to adjust the Earth system as a whole. Here are two good science fiction versions of this that I recommend. Um, in fact, if you want to think about this further, I recommend climate fiction uh, of all kinds. In literature, in print, in games, and in stories, here are two good examples to think about. Generation Z, today's teenagers become the faculty and staff, the dominant faculty and staff. So the ones that have grown up with Captain Planet in their rearview mirror, the ones that have been immersed in climate change, they're now the academic population. How do they change things? How do they alter the world? Well, let's go a little further forward. Let's look at the end of the 21st century. What does that look like? Generation Z are now the trustees, the elders. Right? They're the older statespeople who try to maintain things. Generation Z plus one and plus two are now the faculty and staff, and Generation Z plus three are now the students. Right? What does that world look like? And if you want to really stretch your brain even further, how do one of these trustees in the year 2075 think about us in 2023? Do they think that we were living in the age of stupid, as one documentary says, and we made a whole series of horrible mistakes? Or do they think we are being good ancestors and they can look back at us with gratitude? That's a hard vision to adopt, but I think it's essential. I want to give you a little optimism, and then I'm going to stop. How many of you know the term solar punk? It just has not caught on as a term. Um, but you'll recognize it when I show it to you. Solar Punk is, a, is an artistic school, a design school, that tries to imagine a positive, beneficial Anthropocene. It's not Pollyannish, it's trying to make the best of a situation. And so it often looks like this. You get depictions of environments where the human built environment is mixed in uh, with biology in a kind of biophilic design system. Um, in fact, if you want, there is, an, this is gonna sound weird, there is a Chobani yogurt commercial that is Solar Punk. And this, someone nicely erased the words Chobani in a YouTube video for it, but gives a really good description of it. Uh, this is one AI-generated idea of a solar punk campus. So you can see in the top, we've got like old school campuses, and down here, lots of solar cells, perhaps, and lots and lots of greenery. Um, here's another uh, example of that vision, where we have an old school city, and in front of it, we have a lot of greenery and better designed buildings. Maybe that solar punk vision is what we should be hoping for. Maybe that's what we should have in mind. Maybe we should reinvent higher education in this crisis along those lines. All right, let me pull you back. Back to 2023, back to the present. You have so much to think about. You have so much to do. What I hope, what I really hope, is that you think about the role that higher education can play in our research, in as we change our physical plant, as we change all, everything about us, as we transform the academy, I hope this can play a beneficial role in seeing humanity through our greatest crisis. 
Now, according to federal law, every PowerPoint presentation has to end with a hyperlink. Um, so this is one link where you can find this book. Ah, there are copies out there. I'd be glad to sign them. And best of all, I'd be glad to talk with you. Um, thank you so much for your attention. Uh, we have a panel right now. Uh, how do you want to do this? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. How should we do this? Well, thanks for picking up on that. It was a pretty bold move to try to critique Leopold in, in this room for sure, right? Um, but I, I do think that it's about the uh, agency and the intention, right? Again, we really did believe for a long time that as long as you were out in nature and you learned about it, that you would love it. And we've just assumed that that emotional state turns into action or knowledge, right? David Orr says it uh, very similarly. Um, not all education, right? It, it's, it's not just some positive impact that we can assume always happens, right? Every good teacher knows that. But we've sort of lost the idea that we're gonna have to do some work in the middle, right? I can get you to love it, I can get you excited to protect it, but how do we actually do that? And that means studying um, many things that Dr. Alexander is talking about, but learning how, uh, learning how politics works, learning how decision-making works, running your own meeting, learning how organizing works, how do you build relationships? I, I do feel like, from, from my experience in higher education, we drifted away from teaching those kinds of skills in higher ed, right? It was, here's the content, Here's the facts, right? All of those things are incredibly important, but what do I do with them? How do I really give a good talk? How do I inspire you? How do I move your behavior beyond that? And so those are the kind of things I'm talking about and, and the return to that. And it's, it's why I'm so big on this community and university collaboration piece, because we can provide that out there in the world, right? All the advocates that are out here, you want those uh, volunteers, you want students to come work with you. Students, that's the exact kind of education I feel like was, was missing, right? We have to be providing those kinds of opportunities for folks to make their impact in the world while they're learning all the theories and the ways that we do that. And, and that's, I think, what I'm uh, really excited to to do with all of you. Yeah, can I um, also add, um, I think if I'm not mistaken, Aldo Leopold, he spent a lot of time by himself out in nature. So um, again, what, what um, Denise is saying here is that, you know, a lot of this work takes connection um, in higher education, you're learning, you're engaging, but you're also growing with one another, and that's what I try to inspire in my students. Um, we're uh, sort of beyond that age where we just can kind of go out and spend time in nature all on our own, um, do our own research, learn from ourselves, learn from nature um, itself um, in, in silos, but working together and being connected in collaboration and in relationship, I think, um, is important. Dr. Alexander, I'm wondering if you could comment on the future of AI on teaching and climate teaching and research and development. Uh, specifically on, on climate change and, uh, and academia? Yeah. Um, okay, how to do this in less than six hours. Um, <laughs> well, we, we, we have two countervailing um, uh, dimensions here, right? or forces. One is that uh, the large language models that we use now, uh, thinking of ChatGPT, thinking of MidJourney, BARD, and Bing, they use a tremendous amount of, of data, and they use a tremendous amount of computing power, and so they emit a ton of CO2. Their carbon footprint is immense. Um, and they also use water uh, for cooling uh, in a pretty large amount. Um, this, is, this is also very expensive, too. Uh, so one problem we have is that generative AI may be dangerous for the climate. Uh, the flip side is we might be able to use these tools to try to grapple with the climate. You know, everything from 
having activists and politicians use ChatGPT to generate you know, documents, speeches, memos, and so on, to working with lots of data to produce better analyses and, and better uh, courses of action for us. So these two really collide, and they really intersect in a lot of ways. Uh, I'm a bit optimistic, thinking, I'm looking at the open source world and tools like Llama, Llama 2, uh, are smaller, uh, they use less data, and they have pretty good results. So hopefully we're gonna be shrinking, I hope. Uh, I'm looking closely at what OpenAI does next uh, because their last two huge data sets were enormous and got bigger and bigger. So hopefully they'll be smaller. Uh, I haven't seen academics call this out very much. This doesn't seem to really, people have put these two and two together. In the larger world, this is really a problem. Uh, I think in terms of, of teaching and learning, I, I use AI in my classes at Georgetown. That one of the things I do is I have students you know, interrogate these tools and use them to generate results and then think about them critically and then generate more. So for example, to have, uh, have mid-journey generate art of a campus under certain circumstances. What does a campus look like when wet bulb temperature is up six degrees, for example? Uh, as well as to use some of these uh, tools to, cre to create narratives and models, as well as simulations. Um, I don't know how many faculty are up for doing that right now. I, I hope more. Um, I know they have great support um, at, at certain institutions like this one. Where is our vice provost for uh, professional development? Where'd she go? There you are. Hello. You looked odd ah, because you have a yellow shirt now. That's very different. Okay. Because um, you do all this work of supporting faculty. And one way is to have wonderful people like her to support faculty in doing more and more development. How am I doing so far? Am I coming close to answering your question? Very good. Thank you. Mm, thank you for the question. Next. Okay, looks like it's on. Yeah, so thanks uh, you know, to all of you for, for your presentations. Um, and Brian, we've, I've interacted a few times with you between yesterday and today, this morning also. Um, I don't want to stress, like, at the beginning, I, I feel the urgency of the, you know, of the climate issues themselves. Um, I am, I guess, perplexed. I'm not sure exactly how to insert that urgency into the academy. And the way I'll put it is this, I'll just make an admission. I wasn't familiar, Brian, with your work uh, before you came to our campus. Um, so the first thing I heard was the title of your book, Universities on Fire. And I said, that sounds right. And I wasn't thinking about climate change. You know, there were like six things. There were top, you know, before that. Um, and it's a big issue, and I think, you know, on the one hand, you've highlighted a responsibility, a role for universities. On the other hand, I, I think it's fair to say that, in general, they're some of the more friendly institutions there are to this issue to begin with. And so I'm just thinking about this question of, like, what are we, I don't know, what, what is the charge here? What is the question? Um, and so just for example, when I think about, you know, the faculty, even at an institution like GVSU, you know, so many of our faculty are contingent. Um, and there are subjects, areas that we teach already when we, when we say, you know, the university needs to do this. Uh, it, it's a hostile climate even before you talk about climate change. It's a hostile climate for education for universities. Yes. So are we going to ask, you know, our contingent faculty now to retrain, to also teach, and, you know, I'll throw AI in there, but to teach climate change, to manage these issues, are they supposed to become public intellectuals on 40000 a year? Um, well, trying to hold down their job and make their contract go through. You know, these are the kinds of questions that I feel like are, are the, there's existential questions for higher education and for its traditional mission. And I mean, I don't know, there's just so many existential questions to go around, but I hope like at least the general concern here, I, I, I'd, I'd be curious, you know, what all of you think of that, because I, I feel your urgency and your passion for this issue. But, you know, you, I, there's also just, there's, History to know, there's books to read, and we can barely staff the classes we've got, uh, and that work is less and less attractive to people of, of, of talent. Um, how do we address that? How, what, and there might even be a chicken egg question, because if the university is going to have capacity to address the climate issue, doesn't it have to have the human capacity to, to do that, right? Okay, I'll stop there, but that, so that's my concern. Uh, I, I have a lot to respond, but would you like to? 
Well, if, uh, I, I mean, my publisher would be remiss if I didn't say, well, take a look at the previous book, um, because, um, because Academia Next is, is all about that. I take a look at the demographic changes, the financial pressures in higher education. You speak about adjuncts. I mean, uh, the book is dedicated to adjuncts, of which it's a little incestuous because I am one, so, you know, dedicated <laughs> myself. But, uh, but the adjunct population is the biggest population of faculty in the United States for the first time in our history. Uh, and of course, adjuncts are people who work on individual uh, class basis, usually have no health care, no administrative support, no retirement, and so on. And their pay per hour is comparable to such fine institutions as McDonald's. Uh, when you mentioned 40,000, I thought, my God, who makes that? That sounds terrific, right? Um, uh, I mean, academia is under tremendous amount of pressures already, um, setting aside the climate crisis. And, you know, uh, of course, more recently, you could think about the political pressures, which may be the subject of my next book, where we think about. Um, how the majority of Americans now, depending on the polling, are skeptical of higher education in different ways. Uh, and of course, the, most, uh, the simplest measure is enrollment, which has gone down uh, for 10 years. I mean, COVID accentuated it, but we were going down before them. And after COVID, supposedly, we said, ah, oh, there's a big rebound. The rebound meant we went down 0.9% instead. Yay us. And while this is happening, the American population continues to increase. So as a proportion of the population we're trying to serve, we're beginning to shrink. This campus is off the charts. You guys are actually growing your population. It's terrific. This is really rare. And whatever you're doing, you should bottle it and share it with the rest of us, or better yet, sell it. Um, but uh, but I, think, I think these pressures are extensive and immense. Uh, and I mean, the slide that I skipped through, one of them is how faculty are exhausted. Uh, for the re I, mean, you, I think you were talking last night or this morning about the speed up culture of academics, where to do more and more work. Um, if you have, you're looking non-plus, so maybe that wasn't you. Um, but we do have to do more with less in general. Yeah, that was you, Leslie, okay. The two of you, I don't know if you've met. You, you, you know, there's, a, there's a little similarity there. I'm glad you're dressed differently, you know, that, that helps. Um, but, uh, but, but with all of that, um, I mean, we have, I think, faculty dealing with exhaustion. We have staff dealing with exhaustion. We have senior staff who are concerned about politics, which are increasingly dicey. Uh, media is not very friendly to us. Uh, and so trying to do this, problem is nature doesn't care. Uh, nature bats last, as they say. And this crisis is happening and it's getting worse. It's baked in. If we were to do a spring 2020 and just stop producing any CO2 right now, we won't. But if we were to do that magically and no more methane, we'd still have global warming going on for a century past because it's already baked into the atmosphere. I mean, so there are things we have to do. I mean, I, I keep thinking about the 1930s and 40s or the 1860s for the United States. A bunch of American campuses closed in the Civil War. Others uh, stayed open and did research. We had some medical breakthroughs. In the 1940s, you had academics who played a major role. If, if you've seen the movie Oppenheimer, you get a quick sense of that right now. Um, and maybe this is our job, as hard as it is. And maybe there's things we have to stop doing so much. My PhD is in the long 18th century. I love teaching 18th century literature. I haven't done it for 20 years, because there are other priorities right now. Maybe we have to make that shift. I'm, I'm getting pretty, pretty <laughs> severe here. Please, please, please add to this. I, I'd love to say a bit more. Please add from your perspective. Well, thank, thank you for that. And I think my uh, my first response to you as uh, an academic who left academia, huh? right? Uh, which I'm a tenured person that left an institution doesn't happen, right? I think that. Um, what your question is spot on, and I don't think there's much difference between the issues, frankly. I think they are symptoms of the same cause, and academia is also not unique in the inequities that we are producing. Every sector that we look at in the Michigan Climate Action Network and across the state has the same issues. Right? What are we going to do about tech? Why are we all exhausted? How much can we actually work? These are the actual questions that we need to be wrestling with. And, and I would submit to you that our failure to acknowledge them for the last 40 years is part of why we're so dire right now. Right? This, we've seen the demographic changes in coming to college for 20 years. We've seen climate change coming for 40 years. These systems of oppression, of inequality, of the culture, right, 
of how we manage those, those are all related. So I would submit that when we talk about climate change, we are talking about inequities in workforce and workforce development and eco-literacy and all of those pieces at the same time. I know it's like a lot to, to hold um, and we have our different specialties to bring to that, but that's really how I think we ought to be thinking about those problems. Did you want to chime in? You know, I'll, I'll just say that that's an excellent question um, that you had there. Um, and D Denise, you were really spot on in your response. Um, Dr. Alexander here, um, I may not have mentioned, but at the university, I am joint appointed in um, two different units, mm -hmm. um, one focused on environmental studies, another focused on African American studies and anthropology. And um, having that joint appointment, it allows me to do interdisciplinary teaching. And I would say that, you know, to, to some extent, we're all probably doing that. Um, and, and also to add, just from a personal perspective, um, really, my hair should be on fire with everything that I'm doing in the university, in the community, and engaging uh, with climate change issues. I mean, there are so many topics. Um, now I have to learn about universities and um, mm -hmm. new infrastructure. Mm -hmm. I have to add that to my list now. Yeah. Um, but the fact of the matter is, you know, we can't do everything, but what little bit that we do know, we can share it across um, different spectrums. So I would encourage you to um, look at it more so in that way. Um, and just, you know, like I said, in my, my own personal experience is that I just use this as a way to, to teach an interdisciplinary um, uh, focus because what I teach my African American students and um, in their lessons and what I teach environmental uh, students as it relates to environmental justice, there's overlap. And, um, you know, again, we, we, we can't teach them everything but a little bit um, at a time, so. Thank you. I'll just add, and together, right? <laughs> together is how we, we do this. You don't have to know everything. Deirdre doesn't have to do everything, okay, guys? She certainly could, it I seems know. like. <laughs> uh, thank you all for your, your thoughts, and I don't mean this to be flippant, because I think this conversation and the fast pace of the work that we are expected to turn out, that um, we have to push against it with all we can. So I wanted to ask you all, what brings you joy in your work? In our work? Or life. Maybe both. That's a really personal question. <laughs> oh gosh, you wanna take turns? Sure. How, how about I start first? You bring me joy. Yeah. With that question and being here today, um, the more that I do these sort of conversations and discussions, I'm seeing even more individuals, um, younger people, families, children, and um, it's important to me that I not only talk to individuals about environmental justice communities, individuals that can't be here to speak for themselves, but I know that spreading this word, um, speaking to you guys about these different issues, you're able to take that and you know um, spread the word of, of, of these issues. So really, to be honest, is this is a joy. And, and thank you for your question. She stole my answer, of course, but yeah, I mean, this is, this is it, right? I mean, from my vantage point now, I get to see the folks who are making changes in their life, in their community, in their school, in their bank, in their whatever. That is the most fulfilling and inspiring thing for us to be able to then share some of those stories with all of you, and then you get inspired to go do that other piece. But it's an important question because we also, I think, um, have, have long taken the doom and gloom approach in environment and climate. Um, and there's so much that's beautiful in this world, right? And will continue to be beautiful. I know um, some of our staff had taken some pictures of a sunset during the Canadian fire. Fires, right, mm -hmm. and someone and didn't didn't know that that's why it looked that way. And we were, you know, what a beautiful photo. Mm -hmm. Oh, but does it not beautiful? Because I know it's from fire. It's still beautiful, right? Uh, that kind of that brings me joy. Hmm? Yeah. I, I I was going to answer on, in a lighthearted way um, and talk about uh, my cats and and trying to survive with them and 
um, and to meet their, their peremptory demands all, all day long. But, um, but I think as part of my work, uh, one of the real pleasures is getting to meet a ton of people and to learn from a lot of people. Uh, I get to uh, travel both virtually and, and physically and get to see what people are doing, to learn about great projects and great heroes who are working really hard on this. And it's also intellectually unbelievably rich. I mean, this is the liberal arts world, really, uh, where, I mean, just tonight, what have we been talking about? Uh, government, poli-sci, uh, we've been talking about race and society. Uh, we've been talking about economics, God help us. I mean, there's, and I brought up science fiction. It, it, that's, that's, I think, amazing. Um, and uh, I'm glad to do that. Thank you. Oh, you're going to continue the doppelganger. Yes. Move. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'll try to be short here. Um, so in your book, uh, uh, Brian, you talk about climate change as the new liberal arts. Okay. Um, and this is addressed to all, all three of you um, because you're all in, in invested in, in liberal arts education. Uh, do you think that, that we as a society or societies uh, can adequately address uh, the climate crisis and adapt to climate change without wholesale and full-throated investment uh, in liberal arts education at scale in American society and across the planet? Yeah. No. No. <laughs> it's an easy one. Absolutely not, right? I mean, even the, the social science research I was telling you, we, we know we, we think this particular individual thing, but we're not talking about it with each other. We're not having, finding the joy in that or the connection in that. That's the liberal arts. If I can't talk about it, write about it, make a, a graphic about it or a piece of art or a poem, then I'm probably not going to connect. You know, one of the things that I talk about a lot are some of the social movements over uh, history, right? Most of them had songs, like really good music too, right? In my humble opinion. Where's our music? Where's our art in this movement, right? Um, the liberal arts is what's gonna, what's gonna produce those folks who are thinking in the, those ways. We have to complement. Science is necessary but insufficient, right? We have to complement it. Yeah, I, I, I think this is inherently transdisciplinary. No discipline owns the climate crisis. I mean, earth science, yeah, they're doing an amazing job. Environmental studies, yeah. But if you want to think about something simple, uh, a basic direct problem, you know, what should the city of Houston do about the climate crisis? So immediately, you've got to do urban studies. Uh, you've got to do geology and geography. You also have to do poli sci, God help us, Texas politics, right? Uh, and then you have to think about the people involved, which means you have to think about sociology and psychology, then how you communicate this. Um, it, of course, now that now we think about journalism, we think about the arts and storytelling. I mean, the minute you hit this subject, it becomes liberal arts. Uh, I mean, I, I think some campuses will prefer not to. Uh, they would much rather have electrical engineers who only do electrical engineering, right? Meteorologists who haven't read a single book that isn't meteorology. Um, I, it's a mistake. Uh, it's, it's, it's inefficient and inhumane. What a softball of a question. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I'll just add to that, um, you know, in the liberal arts, we draw individuals from the community. And so um, that's, you know, very vast. And I spoke about my uh, students that I took to uh, Syracuse, New York, to learn about I-81 and the historic 15th Ward. Eight students across uh, different fields um, from lighting, um, in, in, in the arts, to business, mm -hmm. environmental studies, yeah. um, English, so forth and so on. So that's a vast you know, array of different fields and um, areas um, you know, of individuals who had no idea about this issue, who were learning about the issue, and who are inspired now to do more because of this community that they learned about. That's a good example so, right yeah. there. Hello, everyone. I think this is great because I'm always telling people ignorance is not bliss. So to educate, that's my key thing. One of the things that I've noticed has not been mentioned, we talked about trees, we talked about water, we did not talk about animals. And animals definitely alert you to what's going on. When they had the tsunami over in, I forget when it was, no animals. All of the loose animals, they went to higher ground. They know 
that something is different. Is there any climate things that you're doing that's going toward people educating them about life living with animals? He mentioned cats. I'm a cat person. <laughs> really, I'm an animal person, but the cats, God said, no, you're going to deal with cats. I have colony. And I watch them. I see how they react to when it's really, really hot, when it's really, really cold. I, I would like to see some effort pushed out to educate people on taking care of animals that we live with them. They don't live with us, especially the outdoor ones. So if there's there are any climate education going toward care of the na nature of animals in your in your environment where you live. People don't know there's deer in the city, deer in a lot of cemeteries. There's a lot of turkeys in cemeteries. How did they get there? I mean, it's, it's do we take time to include all of the earth, including not just plant life, but animals as well? Great question. I'm inspired, and uh, but also I want to be uh, of my own colony of cats, as Cynthia knows. So I'm inspired by what you're saying, and I can't think of an example which tells me that that's a lot of work to do. Right? We study the effects. We we think about that biotic community. I mean, Robin Rall Kimmerer will tell us that all everything is a teacher, right? And and we're not. I don't think we're paying enough attention to that. Is my astounding answer. So thank you so much. I I. I I feed animal, I have uh, four cats that's my outdoor colony. Along with that, the possums come, and I started giving the po I was scared of it, and still, I don't like it, but I feed it because possums are beneficial to your garden. And so I'm trying to educate people, don't be mean to the animals, and I feed the raccoons. The raccoons are related to bears. So they hibernate when the temperature goes below 40. So the, from now on, I don't have to worry about the raccoons coming to, to eat. But I think that if we extend animal care along with our climate efforts, you'll get a lot of pet lovers that will say, oh, I hate climate, but I love my pets. So yeah. what I can do to help them yeah. to lure me in that way. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, sometimes um, my kids are often saying to me, I'm a mom or my grandkids, they're often saying, not climate change again. <laughs> and we have, a, we have a dog that I love. I'm pretty sure my dog is thinking the same thing, but he just can't say it. So I'm a dog lover and I agree, um, much more can be done to educate um, individuals, especially in the community, about how they're animals and how animals and nature um, are there as you know a part of a pr protection for the environment, but also we need to provide um, protection for the animals. So I will say, as it relates to WEMIAC, we do a lot of environmental um, lessons and education. So there's some incorporation in terms of animals at state parks, um, national parks. Um, I do a little bit of that education um, in my own uh, teaching at the university as well. So, um, but of course, there's so much more that we can do. I, I'll, I'll just add really quickly, we have agriculture programs in a lot of universities and colleges. Uh, and so those have uh, heavy responsibility with animals. Uh, so some of these campuses will actually have you know, a dairy farm on campus. You know, um, and so they, they have that kind of training, along with veterinarian uh, science programs. So they've got that part, but also like the park you were describing, they may have a park on campus, like the ravines here, for example, uh, which then will have animals, like those turkeys, which are incredibly intense birds. They just never leave anything alone. We, had, we raised a turkey once that was madly in love with my mother-in-law. But um, the, uh, uh, I, I, think, I think those two areas, both some of the curriculum and I think also just the degree that we have nature involved with animals, I think we, we're starting to do that. And we should do more. Thank you, Thank you for your question. 
Deidre, Denise, Brian, thank you so much. I know there are many, many more questions, but I suggest that we move um, outside so that we'll have some food and continue this conversation over dinner. So thank you very much. Thank you all so much.